everybody to uh, the great debate on whether it's cold or not. And um, we're doing a thing by, I, you know, many, it's been a long time since we discussed Buddha. And there was a person, whether it was a human person, I'll leave that up to you. It's like Jeheshu with Jesus. Was it a human person? Krishna, was it a human person? I don't think that's relevant. The relevancy is that there was this wisdom and enlightenment which was given to people. If there was such a person as this Buddha, then indeed he could teach in any psych as a psychology professor in any university in the world. Uh, the one that we will discuss is the teachings of one called Shakyamuni Buddha. And the legend is that he was a prince in a castle. And that should be a K in there, I'm sorry. He was a prince in a castle and went out into the streets one day from all of his luxury and saw the, the, the suffering in the streets and gave it all up and, and then went into a monastery to try to find religion, to find this thing called God. And he went, starved himself, went into you know, uh, fasting and so forth. And with all of the religious techniques, he could not find this thing called God. And so he wandered by himself, sent his horse back to the stable at the palace, wandered and found this Bodhi tree. You pronounce it B-O-D-H-I. In Christianity, you refer to it as the tree of life. Actually, it's a mystical thing. Sat underneath it and became enlightened on the east side of the tree. And then he began to teach. And he gave lessons uh, that are left for posterity about dealing with your mind, dealing with other people, and his whole purpose in life was then to ease suffering. He saw little children who were dying and he couldn't understand it. He saw old people who were suffering and he couldn't understand people mourning at funerals. He said, all of the suffering, and, 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 and he said, it shouldn't be. This isn't what life is about. People aren't made to suffer like that. And so what he did is he came up with the one source of all problems and disease and hurt and sorrow, and he summed it up in one word, and that's desire. All suffering has its roots in desire. Shakyamuni Buddha, the legend goes, uh, died at the age of 84, I believe, <clears throat> by eating a bad food that was served to him uh, by whomever. And anyhow, the legend has it that before he died, he called for the person who made the food um, and when they brought that person to him, he reached up from his deathbed and smiled and said, I just wanted you to know that I realized something didn't go the way it should have. However, all that aside, that was the finest meal I've ever had in all of my life. And he smiled and then he died. And so he left the world with never having offended or hurt anybody. And that's what Shakyamuni Buddha is about. Now, of course, Buddhism... There's all kinds of sex as there is in Christianity and in Muslims and all, all of these things, and they have nothing in common <laughs> with, with the Buddha. You know. The Buddha is portrayed generally with a big, fat belly, and that's a symbol. There's no inference that this person, if there was such a person, had a big, fat belly, but the inference of that was that Shakyamuni would teach you should never meditate until you do diaphragmatic breathing, and that is you breathe in and you push your abdomen out so that you fill the bottom of your lungs with air because what he said was that all dis much disease comes from the fact that we breathe shallow and that the bottom of the lungs are never pushed out so that the air doesn't cleanse out what's in the bottom and what lays at the bottom makes you sick. So he always would have people practice diaphragmatic breathing and as a result of that um, uh, he is portrayed as a statue with a big fat <coughs> belly. Okay. Shakyamuni Buddha taught then that there are three necessities in our quest for consciousness. We would call it Christ consciousness. He, he called experiencing what we call Christ consciousness, experiencing what I think is a very beautiful feminine word called nirvana. Okay, That was what he said. If you arrive at this place in your consciousness where you'll find this bliss, this ultimate separation from all of the horrors of the lower mind, you arrive at nirvana. And Shakyamuni said you need three things. One, you need faith. Two, you need practice. And three, you need study. 
Mm-hmm. Now, and, and of course, that's pretty much consistent with most forms of things that you try to understand, you know. But according to Shakyamuni Buddha, faith is what gives rise to practice, and practice is what then propels you on to study. If you have faith, you'll practice it. If you begin to practice it, you'll start to become inquisitive about things that your right hemisphere of your brain start, and you want to look. You want to go and get books. You want to join schools that, that teach things. You want to find out what are all of these things that are now becoming new or, or, or apparent to you that you never understood before. You know. And, and, and many of you have experienced that, and you're coming in here, and, and, and if I have in any way titillated or caused you to have titillated that part of your brain so that you are now you know, interested in finding out about things, and that's good, because that's, that's the most... See, this is where uh, we run into Christianity and we run into a stone wall. Uh, that is, you can practice and you can study only what they teach. You're not allowed to practice and study what the other guy teaches, because then you've become a, 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 a kind of a, a renegade or a turncoat, and, and it's bad. And, and so then you, all you are supposed to do is have faith in their way. Well, that's not the case here. Buddha does not mean faith as a blind belief in something. You know, I believe in something because so-and-so said it. That's blind belief. I believe because I was born this way. That's not belief. That's absolute stupidity. That's all it is. It's ignorance and stupid. Faith to Buddha was a basic desire to become enlightened. And this is what he said. Well, before we get to that, this is what Jesus Christ put it this way, too, and I think it it's, it's tunes into Buddha very well. We see the Christians all the time saying, Jesus is Lord, I have faith, you've got to have faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus. But Jesus says something that's very interesting, and, and if you have those little Bibles there, if you'd open it up to page 838, I want you to see it for yourself. It's in Luke chapter 6, page 838. And this is something that I stand and I, and I would question. I, it, it, I, I very seldom have Christians come to me and, and ask me anything, which I wish they would, other than they will do it anonymously, they won't leave their names or whatever. But this is what I ask, and, and it's a very simple question. It's the same thing that Jesus asked. In Luke 6, 46, Jesus makes this statement, which you can read in your, in your Bible. He said, why do you call me Lord and not do the things which I say? I'm telling you to do. You're saying, Lord, Lord, Jesus, Lord, he is Lord, he is Lord, he's risen from the dead. He said, he's, wait a minute, what the heck are you doing? Don't call me. Why don't you do what I tell you to do? And so then you would have a Christian who would look you in the eye and have to admit, I haven't the slightest idea what he said to do. Because they love one another. They hate each other's guts. I mean, these people shoot one another. In Ireland and in different places, in Bosnia, people are killing each other all over the place because of religious beliefs. But the point that Jesus tried to make is, if I'm Lord, then you have got to do what I tell you to do. And what did he tell you to do? He told you to seek within yourself for the kingdom. He told you to cast your energy to the right side. He told you to practice the single eye. He told you to take no thought. And every one of those things which Jesus taught and are in the Bible, if you do it, Christianity will say it's evil. Don't do it. And that's all he taught. So he says, well, why do you call me Lord? and not do the thing that I say to do. So you can say you have faith, right? You have faith, but unless it's followed up by studying what the man said to do and practicing it in your life, you have none. You have bumper stickers, you have tradition. And you know what it is now? Religion is a game. It's entertaining, it's a social entity, it's Wednesday night covered dishes and all of this stuff, and it's going to church and singing songs, but it is not getting into the nitty-gritty of changing lives because in 2,000 years of Christianity and other religions too, the world has become an absolute nightmare of violence. A nightmare of violence. And it is based upon one big word. Fear. And you can also call it, and I like to coin this phrase better, Armageddon insanity. Because the whole basis of it is a fear and a nuclear holocaust that is, and this nuclear holocaust is supposedly orchestrated by God. So the whole thing is based on fear. 
Instead of being based on a redetermination to revitalize the earth, to bring people together, to restructure this in a framework of a oneness, of a, of a unity of life, and with the animals and nature, no, the heck with that. We're going to have this great God that we've been following around all our lives have a nuclear war to end the whole thing. I mean, you know, he started it off by, by, by cruc torturing his son to death, and now he's going to finish it with the f last act is going to be Armageddon. So the whole thing is fear. You say. We don't dare say anything because, you know, we're afraid. So listen, listen to Buddha when we get back to talking about faith. Buddha says this, faith means to believe in the inner way and devote yourself to it confidently. No matter what waves and storms may buffet you, no matter what criticism or persecution may assail you, no matter what karma may confront you, you then say, I don't care, I am following the inner way. I am turning myself and looking within myself because I cannot do anything for you or you or you until first I square with myself. Unless the war is over in here, the war will never be over out there. And it's not easy. But that's the only way. That's the path towards Buddhahood. If you're convinced of this, then you call it faith. Say, there's a lot of people that come to church here. And we have them, they come and they go, and they come and they go. But when it comes time for the meditation, many, they don't. It's a whole different thing. It's fun to listen to it. And it's exciting to see some of the things, how they work out. And it's exciting to see the words and the numbers and all of these things. But practicing that silence of getting to know yourself plugging into yourself, purging away all of that which is the hard part and smoothing you into a, into a communion with nature, people don't want to do that. So to say this is right is not good enough because it's not doing anything for you or for anyone else and it proves that you don't have faith. To have faith is to actually enter in and practice this. All the talk in the world is a waste. All of, all of the schools, all of the training, all of this stuff is just a temporary thing. You'll get better for a while and then you'll go right down into the slop again until you do this. You have faith, you practice, and you study. And this is the important thing. Buddha said that people will not devote themselves to this because of one thing. They have no faith in themselves. And he says, that's the frightening part. People have no faith in themselves. And how could you? You've been told by religion you're nothing. You're fakakta. You're a waste. You're sinners. You're all dirty laundry. I mean, how could you have faith? Buddha said, once you begin to have faith in yourself, then you can start your movement upward. I, um, in the earlier days, a lot of people used to call me names. I don't get called names too much anymore. That's somewhat frightening to me. Because, well, I'm very serious about it. Because in following Jesus, look what he says on page 780. Matthew chapter 5. And this is important to me that I square up with what he says. And, he, he, and he'll put it right on the line with you. But we're afraid, see. We're, we're afraid to stick our neck out because we don't want to get criticized. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11, he said, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. In other words, because you do what I tell you to do, people are going to get ticked off and say all kinds of rotten stuff about you. And you know what? You're, the only, you're in the only church that I think probably in this state where that happens. I don't know of another church that does obey what Jesus says, uses the Bible to confirm it, and everybody gets ticked off. Even to the point where, remember, a few years ago they sprayed the place with red paint. And so that's exciting to me when you fulfill what he says. He says, when you do what I say, people are going to get ticked off and call you all kinds of names, and they do. But here then, Buddha says, if one does not have faith in oneself, or if that faith is shaken by something or someone else or by the lack of immediate success, one will never achieve. You should listen to that again. Buddha, if one does not have this faith in oneself, or if that faith is shaken by something or someone else, or by the lack of immediate success, one will never achieve. 
And many of us, you know, who the, you know who shakes our faith? Our family. I just got a letter from a guy. He said, I can't get the tapes anymore. He said, I really enjoyed them, but I can't put up with my mother and her wisecracks. So he says, don't send me any more tapes. And it happens all the time. It happens all the time. Because you'll have people that'll really come. And you know what Jesus said? What did he say? I've come to set father against son. I've come to set mother against daughter. I've come to set family against family. Because you're going to break right into the middle of tradition. What did he do? He came right into the middle of the most traditionalized religion in the history of the world. Probably one of the most, the Jewish religion. And what did he do? He upset it. Did everything contrary to the way they said you should do it. You, you, didn't, you want to say something? You forgot what you, what do you, oh, okay. Well, when you remember, right? That's okay. Don't, I want to tell you something. We were at lunch today, and Joni Schultz said that she wanted to raise her hand, and she had something to say. And then she said, I was on a roll, so she didn't do it. Don't ever worry about I'm on a roll. I can be on a million rolls. Raise your hand. Uh, you know, if you have something that's interesting and you want to, I forget what, that, what she was saying, and, and you know, I can't think of it now, but it was very interesting, and it could have added a lot to the, the, you know, what was being said this morning. So don't be afraid. Okay, here we go. Why don't you come on up here? Come on, Mer. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Cause, well, that's uh, who's grandson? Nobody knows. Those people don't know who's grandson. Grandson Gil, who lives in, in uh, California, said about you, that's the greatest guy. He said, how'd you find him in freaking New Jersey? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> or words that I was upset. Well, how did you find? Well, that's real. No, but that's nice. So that's very nice. <coughs> and where was I? Oh, I was, I was, I was just telling you that, that that's good. If you have something there, do that. Okay. What, what Shakyamuni Buddha is saying then, what you've got to have faith in is yourself. You've got to believe in yourself because nobody else believes in you. And don't think they do. Nobody does. Everybody is trying to find something to believe themselves for. And will use you in any way possible to elevate their own particular height. I mean, I see it in business all the time. The corporations, they're nice as pie to you as long as they look good as a result of it. If they look bad as a result of you, zippo, quick. And this is the way it is. So you've got to believe in yourself. What did Jesus say? Physician, heal yourself. There's a sign at the, uh, in Greece at the Oracle at Delphi. It says, to your own self be true. Because you are absolutely worthless to anybody or this world or your family if there's turmoil in here. You've got to find this holy place within yourself. You've got to find that flow in harmony within yourself. And then things will start to move beautifully on the outside. Faith is trust. How do you have faith? You have faith in your doctor. If you, you know, here's, here's an amazing thing. We, we get on this, here we go to Key West. We get on this plane. There is, must have been 300 people on this thing. Television sets coming out of the ceiling, music coming out of the thing. This thing starts traveling down the runway, must have been 500 miles an hour. I never ever even saw the driver. I don't even know there could have been a maniac up there. I had no idea. I'm sitting there, Joan City. We always say a little prayer when this thing's taken off. We hold hands and say, well, you know, then Jesus, if you're really true, you know, uh, uh, you know, so. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You don't take any chances, you know. I, you know. I'll play both sides. So anyhow, here comes this thing taking off, jet plane, going up into the clouds like this. Zoom, like a rocket. I never even saw the guy who's driving. I don't even know if he's got a license. So what did I have? <laughs> faith. <laughs> Absolute faith. I mean, that's where you put your money on the line, aren't you? You just assume that there must be somebody that knows what's going on. You get on a bus. You don't ask the driver for his license. You don't ask him if he knows where he's going. You have faith. You trust. See, that's where, that's where Christianity can't deal with the teachings of Jesus Christ because they involve meditation. And they don't trust meditation. 
They're afraid of meditation. They do not trust anyone with their mind, including Jesus. You can't do that. See, here's a, in, in, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22, Jesus Christ said, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. That's a promise. You practice the single eye, you fill with enlightenment. You fill with understanding. You fill with wisdom. But they can't deal with that. They don't faith. They don't have enough faith. They don't trust him. So you can't have faith in, in Christ because what? What are you told to do with religion? Have you ever gone, I don't know which churches you've gone to, in a Christian church, and have you ever been told to move out of the aspect of your mind? Have you ever been told to leave the thinking. Have you ever been told to leave the, you know, the operation of your mind? To, in other words, separate from the thoughts of the mind. Never. You've been told to study. You've been told to think. You've been told to listen. You've been told to do all of these things that operate in the mind. And Romans 8, 7 says something. And I'll show you why religion is not successful. Because it operates out of the carnal mind, which means the mind of the senses. What attracts you in religion? The colors of the, of the, of the costumes, the, the stained glass windows, the beautiful church the magnificent organ, all of these things are from the carnal mind because they're sensual. You know, they, they appeal to your senses. The choir sings, amazing grace, what a wretch am I. And you all love it. You know, you sing it, amazing grace, I'm a wretch. Is this a great song? And then you say, this is wonderful, hallelujah, I'm a wretch. You know, amazing grace that saved a wretch. Like the guy that wrote it is a wretch. Why should you sing that you're a wretch? He's probably a wretch. And why well, certainly he was a wretch. He was a slave dealer. He used to take boats out and carry slaves. He was a wretch. But do you go, what do you got? He makes this song, Amazing Grace That Saved a Wretch Like Him. And he's got Joe standing up there singing, Amazing Wretch That Saved a Wretch Like Me. Amazing Grace. Yeah, so, so this is the point, okay? The point is you do all of this out of the mind. And look what it says on page 924 in the Bible. It says on page 924, Romans chapter 8, verse 7, that the carnal mind is enmity against God, is not subject to the law of God, neither can it be. So if you try then to follow the precepts of God through the mind, you can't do it because you're using that which is God's enemy, your own mind. Your mind is God's enemy. That's the interesting part. And that's what we're really going to look at when we get into studying these Genesis things about the aspects of the left side and the right side, Esau and Jacob. Because all of these things are not real people. They're all parts of you. You have an Esau inside of you. You have a Jacob inside of you. You have a, an Abraham inside of you. You have an Ishmael inside of you. All of these things are parts of those aspects of your mind. And the evolution of the mind is portrayed in these things. So you cannot do So how do you develop faith? So how do you develop faith so that your mind will accept it? That's the interesting thing. Well, you take your car to a repair shop and you say, well, I don't know what's wrong with it, but you take it there and the guy fixes it. You take it back, fixes it again. Pretty good. Take it back a third time, fixes it again. You say, gee, this is a good place. You go to the doctor. The doctor says, oh, this is what's wrong. You feel better. He gives you the right medicine. You go to him again, makes you feel better again. He takes care of you. You develop faith. By trusting yourself to people, you develop faith in those people. You have to do what? You have to practice. You have to actually involve yourself in a physical interplay with other people. And if they're being true to you, you'll develop faith in them. You can't have faith in somebody simply on the basis of somebody else's recommendation because many times somebody's going to recommend something and it's going to get screwed up. You're going to go to that person and they're going to screw you up. But if you do go because somebody said this works, this person knows what they're doing, then you go a couple of times, you start to have faith because you're practicing this interplay with that person. So there's, a, there's the thing. You cannot have faith in what Jesus teaches. You cannot have faith in what Buddha teaches. You cannot have faith in what Krishna teaches until you try doing what they said to do. You try it. You come. You come into a meditation, you take your shoes off or whatever you do, you sit on the floor, you own whatever, you then find yourself, you hang on until finally that cord between you and that left side which is holding you down is cut and the kite flies and soars away out into the blue. And suddenly you find out, this does happen. Something happens here and you start thinking differently. 
It is not an easy, all of a sudden, I'm here, and next minute I'm here deal. It's not like that. It is a transition that takes time and moves through the universe, kind of like that plane does. Sometimes they get into places where it's a little bumpy, and then he's got to climb a little higher till he gets over the clouds, and things start to smooth out, and the sun shines. But there's plenty of clouds to go through. When you begin to experience a life-changing improvement, you begin to have faith. You've got to have something to hang on to. You've got to think better. You've got to feel better. It doesn't mean that all of the other things go away. What's the sense of having all of the other things go away? Oh, my son is still doing this. I'm meditating in my son's doing this because your son isn't meditating. What's he got to do with it? You surround yourself in a family with a bunch of absolute lunatics. You're the only one that's like, I'm meditating, everything's okay, but look at them, they're all a bunch of lunatics. Well, they're not, so then look at them. And what do you do? You tell them, meditate, and they laugh, they throw you, get out of here, you're nuts. Go down with all of those crazy people and go home. Man. <laughs> yes, why don't you come up here? No, just, what, oh, you, no, nobody can hear you. The paper play. Come on, right away. Get up here, get up here this minute. This must be a, come on. Question, what's the difference between uh, oming chanting and uh, people say, uh, I say the rosary? Nothing. There is not, not a thing. Same. Not a thing. As long as it's being done with a, in a mantra. The rosary is uh, um, a repeated prayer to Mary over and over and over again. And I'll tell you something. It's Muslim. It originated out of the deserts of Arabia. You'll never see a Muslim uh, without his rosary beads. It's all the same thing. They're repeated. You repeat the same thing on and on and on. But you see, the problem with it is this, and it's a good question. As a Catholic, as a child, we were told to pray the rosary. Nobody told me it was a mantra. I didn't know what it was supposed to do. I, all I knew was to say, I'm going out of my mind. Enough with the saying, the Mary, she heard it. What does he have to say? Hail Mary, God, one. I mean, what is this woman? Does she cannot hear? What is this? I got to say this 50 times to this lady. What? Don't get it? Because they didn't tell me. You're saying this over and you're saying it over. And to, you know what it is? It is trying to do what? Deceive the mind. Basically. And it's a beautiful mantra. For a person that knows Catholicism, loves Mary, has a rosary, by all means, it's meditation. We had a woman in here one night that was scared to death. And we started to meditate. The lights went down. And I saw her start to freak. I said, well, you're a Catholic. She says, yeah. I said, you get your rosary? She says, yeah. Take it. I said, okay. I said, yeah. Ah! And she had a rosary. That's wonderful. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it. It's a mantra. Chanting. Whatever. And it serves its purpose. So, Whatever you want to call it, what's the difference? As long as it works, you see. So, when Jesus says, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light, you're never, ever going to know if it works until you practice it. You'll never, ever know if it works. And how will you know? You'll know because, first of all, you'll start to think differently. You'll start to feel differently. You'll start to see things differently, and then you'll progress. You cannot have faith in anybody or anything until you experience a change in your life. And that comes by feeling better, thinking better. Buddha said, listen to what Buddha said, Shakyamuni Buddha said, faith cannot exist without practice and study. One cannot believe in Buddha if one does not practice any more than one can have faith in a medicine he has never taken. See? Isn't that interesting? So he said, well, I don't believe that that stuff works. But you've never tried it. It's like, you know, food. Well, I wouldn't. I don't think I'd like that. But you've never tried it. Or I, I wouldn't take that medicine, or I wouldn't take that vitamin, but you've never tried it. You're just standing on a tradition somebody else has told you. See? So here then you have, oh yes, I have faith. I believe meditation, but you never meditate. Look what the Bible says about it. Go to page 988. Page 988. You're in the book of James, and now you can see what, what Buddha's talking about. You're in James chapter 2, okay? Look at verse 17. Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead. What good is it? What good is it to say you have faith in Jesus if you don't do what he says to do? That's exactly what that's saying. What good is it to say, well, you know, meditation is great if you don't do it? It's no good at all. You, no matter what you get involved in, and in New Age, there's a lot of things that are steering people into all kinds of stuff, and they're not touching the center 
where all things originate. They're really not touching it. They're adding things that somebody else said, do this and do that and do the other thing, and they wave feathers and they smoke, and they sit in Sidonia and they hear things coming out. And what has changed in here? Absolutely nothing. All that they have is experiences, emotional experiences, and they haven't taken one step towards that Garden of Eden, which is within their own consciousness. And it doesn't make any difference. You can take people that fly out to Arizona or go on Vortex or wherever they want to go. I'll get one person sitting on the floor here who will really plug himself in and raise that conscious level to 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds of absolute nothingness. That person has gone right into the heart of God. That's what counts. That's what will change. That's what will change your life. That's what will change your health. That's what will change your family. That's what will change the world. And once you and that person in Japan are both oming and in the center of that jet stream of nirvana, then you're one. And when there's that oneness all over the world, the whole cosmos will begin to change. Buddha said this quite simply, in order to learn the art of living, how to improve the quality of life for ourselves and others so that we can become truly happy and fulfilled in this lifetime, we must follow and we must practice. It won't work any other way. It won't work any other way. See, <laughs> what? All of you were Christians at one time. You all went to church, didn't you? And what you go to church for? So that when you died, you went to heaven. That's the only reason you went. You were scared to death to miss for fear you'd drop dead and they would have been right and you didn't go to heaven. That's the only... I don't know of anybody that goes into Christian church that is, I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. Hallelujah. I'm, that's all. I'm going to heaven. When? When I die. See, which is a pretty traumatic situation. It's got to happen before you're going to go to heaven. You're going to have to drop dead in order to get your salvation. Now, I want you to see something. That's not what Jesus taught. He didn't teach that. That's why I have quarrels with Christianity. He taught something for you. He taught something for each of you sitting here. He taught something for you sitting out there. And tell, let me show you what he taught. Page 875. This is what he taught. And it's totally contrary to that thing that is, is taught in, in religion. It says in John chapter 10. Are you there? Page 875. Is that it? Uh, John chapter 10. Look at verse 10. He says, Thief comes not but to steal and destroy. I am come that they might have what? Life and have it how? Abundantly. Like Reverend Ike said, have your cake and ice cream with chocolate on top and a strawberry and whipped cream. Have fun. Have a good time. Enjoy yourself. That's what this is supposed to be. That's what Buddha took. That's what he took on. He took on something. He didn't take on the fact that when you die, you go somewhere. When you die, you get out of your body and you go find a new one so that you can have life. See? And the whole sort of religion is twisted. They want you to have something when you're dead. And Jesus, what did he just say? I want you to have life and have it abundantly, an abundant life. And Buddha said you should be happy, but you've got to practice. See? So, faith without doing the practice is dead. There can be no finding of this truth in your life without inner meditation. So, what do we do? And we'll wrap it up with this. How do we practice according to Buddha? Practice is described by Shakyamuni in two categories. Practice for yourself and practice for others. Practice for yourself and practice for others. You change your karma when you meditate. Your karma is simply that which is the result of the early part of this life and previous lives. What you have allowed to come in here is manifesting in you right now. It's the same if you, if I eat <laughs> some food that I shouldn't eat, that will be the cause. The result, I'm not going to go into it right now, but that will be the result. In other words, I allowed it to enter in, it's going to have a result. Um, each one of you have something that whether you eat or whether you drink it or whatever, if you allow it to go into yourself, you're going to have a result. And it's not going to be a pleasant result. Okay? So that's exactly what he's talking about. What have you allowed? The reason, excuse me, the reason that you are the way you are now is because of the way you have been in the past. 
And the way you're going to be in the future is dependent on the way you are now. And so how do you say, well, <laughs> I want to break the cycle. You break that cycle, what they call karma, by meditation. Meditation chops the cord and sets you off in an entirely new direction. That's the beautiful part of this. Okay. So you change your karma when you practice meditation. And when you change, not only do you benefit yourself, you benefit others. How could you, you know how, you know how I answer it? Here you got somebody that's on the dole in the family. The whole family, this guy can't work, he has no faith in himself, he doesn't care about himself, he has no hope for himself, so we got to support him and they got to give him a place to live and the whole thing is a mess and everybody's broke. And so he changes the karma. And so there's a lack. You now, you have, suddenly he decides, I feel differently, I think differently. He goes up, he feels good about himself, he goes and finds a job, he gets paid, he's got money, the family doesn't have to give him money, they're happier. Now they can teach others to change their karma because they don't have to worry about this guy who's on the dole, and now we got more money, now mama can go to the doctor because she doesn't have to give it to this bum, she's taking care of herself, her health is better, everybody's happy, blah, blah, blah. Why? Because one person in the family changed their life. And they couldn't change it by doing anything on their own. They changed it by allowing this beautiful thing to enter within. You have faith. You practice your meditation. And once you practice your meditation, you'll start to be led to books. You'll start to be led to different places. And then you'll start to underfine. You'll find things the way you can help yourself and the way you can help other people. But you'll never see what's waiting for you unless you enter within yourself and cast your net to the right side and allow this beautiful thing to happen. Nirvana? It's true. Nirvana is inside of you, and she's waiting to meet you. Nirvana is a coiled serpent, and she's a female, and she's coiled at the base of your spine three and a half times. And when you start to practice, she awakens, and she raises herself upward, and she opens her jaws, and she swallows within herself all of the things that have hurt you, all of the things that have made you angry, all of the things that, you have, made, that have made you sick, and she cleanses you from all of these things. And she raises herself, and she puts out that tongue, and it touches that beautiful gland at the top there called the pineal gland, and it opens the door to the kingdom at the right side. And then the beautiful doves of peace begin to flow from out the windows of that beautiful temple, and then you're surrounded by peace and love. Practice it, and as you do, then in your waking hours, you'll want to go to libraries, you'll go to schools, you'll go wherever, because you'll want to study more, and you'll find your niche in life. All because you suddenly changed what had never been given to you in the past. You started to recognize you're special, and that's what Jesus tried to tell you. The kingdom is within you. You're the light of the world. The things that he did you can do, you can do better than him. But before you'll ever be able to experience that, you'll have to break the yoke of religion that says you're a sinner. And you'll have to take up that which is the truth of Jehoshua the Christ who says, no, you're not a sinner. You're the light of the world. Have faith in yourself. Practice the single eye. Then start to study the truths of the ancients and lift yourself to the blessings of nirvana. And not only will you change and your family will change, but the entire world will change. And that's what you're seeing happen in many parts of the world right now. We were talking this morning, Nelson Mandela is the president of South Africa. That is an absolute impossibility, but nirvana came. And the Israelis have pulled out of Palestine, and, 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 and their Palestinians are free. That's an impossibility, but nirvana came. And that's just a little bit of the beautiful things that are happening. Yes, ma'am. Come up here. Please, thank you. So That's great. Are you, whoop, whoop, that, whoop, 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 yes. are you saying that you change once the coiled serpent is goes up, uh, once you're enlightened? But in other words, you could be meditating here every night until that comes to you. You haven't changed. Right. But there's and that's <coughs> a little frustrating. No, no, it's not frustrating. <laughs> it's, it's a very, very important thing, okay? Because when you're ready and when this can handle what's about to happen, then the change will occur. But before this will be able to handle all of the junk in the attic has to be cleared out. All of the old dirty stuff in the attic has to be swept clean and once everything is ready then all of the new things can be moved in. But right now there's no room for the new thing. I'm not uh, talking about you. But when there's room up here for the new things then they'll be moved in. That's what you're raising is an extremely important thing. And that's where people have to wait and be patient. Many of us have gone 30, 40, 50 years accumulating. This is the way Shakyamuni Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha taught it this way. He said, you know what? He says, 
and, and he didn't talk like this, but this is the point, so I'll make it for him in, in, in 1994. He said, you know, you people have been living in a cesspool all of your life. And you started meditating, and you've regained your sense of smell. And you say, guys, this is worse than before I started. Mm -hmm. Now, you just realize now how bad mm -hmm. it is. But Nirvana septic pump cleaners come and pump all of that stuff out. This is what she raised is so important because we took a lot of years to accumulate this crap, excuse the French, and we want it all to be flushed as you would in the yeah. John, and it doesn't work that way. And this is the way Jesus put it, I have so much to tell you, but you couldn't bear to hear it now. Mm -hmm. It takes us to be faithful and practice this meditation, and then as we are true to it, all of that stuff will be cleaned. And when it's all ready, nature will move in and bring you all that's new. Really, that's the only way it can possibly help. And that is not a religious, that's an actual scientific principle that, you know, the subconscious has been loaded up with all of that hurt and now the subconscious has to be set free of that. It all has to be drained out. So you are all. changing even when you're just not, even when you're trying. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, Hare Krishna put it, not one bit of meditation, not one second is ever wasted. It's like uh, the little seed that you put in the ground, you know. You have to be patient. There's nothing that you or anybody else can do but wait until it comes. But to be understand, to have tremendous faith in yourself that what you're doing is a practice that was not only taught by Buddha and Krishna but Jesus, but that it works and it works beautifully, but it has to do its work in its time. Okay, thanks. That's a good question, and that really is a good question. And that oh, wait, uh, yeah, come on, please. Come on, come up. I'm not okay. doing But see, if it, like what you're saying is, is that you can't jump the process, okay? That everything in it in its time, and that um, it's just like you can't take a child and put them from kindergarten to the sixth grade and expect them to be able to be successful there. They have to go through that whole process. And I, I think what you're saying is is that we're going through a healing and we're getting rid of, of what we don't need and what we have accumulated because we, we can't jump and take on this beauty of what can be mm. and still have one foot in the other world, right? That, 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 that you would have one foot here and one foot there and you would not be balanced. That is right, and in, in, in many other ways too, what a lot of folks don't understand is they open themselves to meditation. Many people will go to meditational places and meditate, okay, and they'll relax. But when the door opens and something comes to them, they haven't the slightest idea what it is because they haven't studied. They don't mm -hmm. have any idea what was told to them by Christ or Buddha or Christ. It is absolutely important that you do listen to these teachings so that as these things happen to you, you'll understand what, otherwise you don't have the slightest idea what's going okay, on. Okay, because then otherwise then it's, it's ego involved and it's, it's desire nature, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's not centered on the kingdom that's within you, it's centered on things from the outside. It's, it's what I want, I want to be there. Mm -hmm. that's, that uh, is another extremely important thing. And in the meditation process, okay, you have to be like a person standing next to a flowing river. You have an inner tube around you. You have no idea where that river is going. Mm -hmm. You have to have the faith to jump, and it carries you where it wants you to go. You will never, ever, ever, and if you're trying to achieve a particular thing in meditation, forget it. You'll never, ever do it. You have to, meditation, and the key of this whole thing is, I am offering myself as a sacrifice for the common good of the universe. Use me. Whatever you want, whatever I do, I jump and jump. Once you go, that's it. You know, you may want to meditate so you can go to Key West and you might wind up going to Adak, Alaska because the spirit is now has your permission to take you wherever. So take, try to take your mind out. It's a real good point. Take your mind out of it and you sit and you meditate and say as uh, 
Dinah, or not Dinah Doris, they said years ago, whatever, case sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. Then you'll move with it. Then you move with it. And, and there's no, um, in the healing process that we go through, there's no time span. Like, it, like one person might move through it fast and another person slower. Well, you see, the point is on that, you know, we want to, like was just said a moment ago, we're anxious to get this going. But when you look on the other side of the veil, we don't realize that you've got three million years to go. And so, <laughs> you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of lifetimes. So there is not any urgency on the part of nature that you have this happen tomorrow. You're seeing changes in the earth. You're seeing changes in the political structure and in countries. This is to give you confidence as to what is happening. Okay? The things that we talked about could not happen unless there was this mighty pouring of Aquarius upon you now. The energy is there. You can plug into it right now. Okay? This is the time. Not, it wasn't like it was uh, 50, 60 years ago. It is stronger and more powerful. When you enter in, it opens to you. I can tell you for a fact that things came to me, and I, when I read this Bible down in, in, in Florida, that I had no business ever understanding. I've read those things a hundred times and never saw them, and bang, they came to me. Just, you know, it, w it was just instant. You know, and so I know that it, this is work, and it is nothing to me any more than anybody else here. But you've got to be willing simply to say, I enter myself into this river and let it carry me wherever it will. Mm -hmm. But just always do that knowing that nature never sends one of its migratory animals in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. It sends them to where they should go. Yes. The goose doesn't leave Canada and go to Hoboken. Mm -hmm. It goes where it's supposed to go. And one thing that you, you said some time ago, too, is, is, is that once you've reached a conclusion, your journey is over, so that we shouldn't be trying to write the end of the story, just like flowing with it and, and healing in the process and in reaching where we're supposed to go and, and not saying, I've got to have this total enlightenment, you know, because in this lifetime, some of us might not, you know, a lot of us won't get to that point. Well, you know, that's a, that's a conclusion, though. Even what you just said is a yeah, conclusion. That's, true. Uh, that's whether we get to it, whether we don't get to it, no yeah. one's ever going to know. You might get to it tonight. Uh, that You'll get where you're supposed to be yeah. when you're supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. You know, when the goose flies from Canada, it's going to land in Acapulco when it's supposed to because nature's in control of it. Your life, if you'll offer it to nature, you offer it to the universe, you offer it to God, your life then is stamped. You have a job, you have a mission, and you are going to be placed into that mission, and you're going to go where you're supposed to go. And it never, there's never a mistake. So we can't even reach a conclusion and say, maybe the whole world's going to get it. I don't know. That's not relevant anymore, okay? But I, I can only say, and what, what Buddha talked about and what we've discussed tonight is, if you're willing, finally, to trust yourself and have faith in yourself and have faith in this, you know the way you should have faith? Look at the alternative. Mm -hmm. What else is, you've tried everything. You've tried religion, just exactly what Buddha did. You've tried social programs. You've tried politicians. You've tried wars. You've tried doctors. You've tried everything there is. And all you found is you're getting older and getting a little more frustrated and a little more ticked off and it's getting a little more violent. So finally there's this one path, and it's put this way. It's called a pineal stone, mm -hmm. which is a little gland in the brain, and it's described as the, in the Bible as the stone that the builders rejected has turned out to be the most important stone of all. Mm -hmm. Touch it, touch it, and let it light for you. And then you'll prove to yourself. You will prove to yourself. But just like you said, mm -hmm. it requires you to just stay and be determined and follow it, and follow it, and follow it. It's like that big plane we were on the other day. It goes, and goes, and goes, and goes, and then all of a sudden, it's not on the ground anymore. Mm -hmm. It has lifted off. How come? Because it plugged into a higher law. It overcame the law of gravity, not by breaking it, but by plugging into the law of aerodynamics. Mm -hmm. You can never break a law, but you can plug into a higher law. Mm -hmm. So when you plug into this law, this law of a divine consciousness, you're not breaking the carnal law, you're plugging into a higher law. That a little plane took you there, too. Yeah, well, <laughs> scared the hell out of me, too. Okay, thank you very much, and we'll see you around.